Okay, hi everybody, welcome back, and we are using Top Hat today. I know it was the second video talking about the divisions of the nervous system. It was, there. Some, fortunately one of you pointed out, hey, the audio seems off, and then I was like, oh. So what I actually saw is that when I looked up the problem, like YouTube Studio Editor, it was like, I tried to trim the video, so it was like, I mean, it was something I tried to trim. It looked good on my end, but when I tried to use incognito and saw it on the other end, I was like, oh shoot, it is totally off sync. So it turns out it's still a problem with YouTube Studio Editor and they say, oh, use the old YouTube Studio Editor, the OG one, which they phased out and I can't access anymore. So I apologize for that, I just reverted it. So it is a little longer now and does have some extra top hat questions. So yeah, if any of the videos are off sync, let me know. And then I'll have to download them and then upload them again and then trim them out of the YouTube Studio Editor. But yeah, that's another, that's a whole other um, thing to worry about. But yeah, if it is off sync, it's because of that. I blame YouTube. And luckily Reddit supports my claim that yes, YouTube was screwing up that part. And yes, I am a little, if I seem a little off right now, it's like, yeah, those med students, they just had their midterm and there's a lot of questions about their midterm and their results. So everyone's concerned about midterms this week. I'll have your midterm results uploaded by the end of this week. Again, there are pending. And again, I, or should I even mention averages? Cause I hate it when people complete, I mean, comp compare each other be and get down on themselves. And it's like, don't give up. I mean, I'm just trying to root for everyone right at this point right now. But yeah, it's like, if again, <laughs> It's like the average people on average did pull up a bit and if you slid back a bit again it's about your own knowledge and I do consider the big picture at the end of everything all right and okay so the Manoa CSDC now everybody has access to this everyone has access to if you're a student here at UH Manoa you have access to services at the CSDC now the thing is that I'm unless things changed I mean I think the last time I heard you get six free sessions I forgot if it was per semester or year but yes you do have sessions with these counselors and somebody was talking about is they said they about crying during the test and if that is if it helps but if it's you're finding that you're getting anxious about tests to the point that it's affecting your performance on just school in general, by all means, reach out to a counselor. You do have these available. So there are free sessions, at least the last time I checked. And the counseling services, so they're there. And sometimes, even if you're not, don't have anxiety, sometimes they have tips on how to ground yourself during a test. And a lot of students who have used them in the past, they said, hey, I didn't realize I had test anxiety, or like, I don't have test anxiety, but they taught me techniques that really helped me manage my anxiety during tests or just in school in general. So this is your little mental health talk today. And again, I'm not licensed, I'm not Dr. Todd Grande. I can't provide any sort of counseling services, but I'm not trained, that's my not my field. But yes, they are there for all UH Manoa students. So this is a very good resource and for everybody who's enrolled. Okay, so back to business. Uh, woo. Hey, that's what you see from the back end. Hello. All right. Okay. So let's ask everybody <laughs> behind the veil, right? So what have you, let's ask the first question. Have you ever taken a physics course? No right answer. But I just want to gauge what everyone's knowledge is right now. Yeah. So it seems like, oh, maybe half of us took something, half of us never did. So yeah, it's like, well, if it seems very, very, ex like almost reductive, my explanation of this physics part, uh, I'll, I'll explain this is, this is why, because a lot of you haven't had physics yet. So what are we talking about today? So we're talking about neurons. We're still talking about nervous tissue. And here's a typical neuron. And what we have are these axons. So these axons project from a neuron and they carry those action potentials to uh, like target cells. It might be another neuron, it might be another cell like in the motor, in the neuromuscular junction. We have a motor neuron telling a skeletal muscle cell what to do. But in this example, we have a neuron relaying a signal to another neuron. 
And where do these signals start? They start out at this part called the axon hillock. So what happens is that this axon hillock is where you generate these action potentials and they travel along the membrane of an axon called the axolemma. Just remember, or remember like the plasma membrane of a muscle cell is called the uh, sarcolemma. The axolemma is the membrane of an axon. So these action potentials travel along the membrane and then they reach their target and they spread along these structures called telodendria and then they reach something called the axon terminals and there are multiple axon terminals so it's, you start off with one axon and sometimes you have these collaterals to the side as well but for simplicity let's just pretend there's only one axon in this example so it's branching out to multiple areas and it, these branches can spread to one target axons, many target axons so what happened, or not, <laughs> many target neurons. I know it's really tough today. All right, so they spread all into these teledendria and end up at multiple axon terminals. So it's just like when you terminate something, you end it. So these are the ends of the axons. And if we zoom in, what do we see here? Well, we see the small projection of the initial, what we call presynaptic neuron, and this postsynaptic cell we see over here. In this case, it's a neuron. Now we're going to answer the question. Remember that pre, before this example, or before this, this unit, this last unit of our semester, action potentials were just some sort of mysterious electrical activity and ions were involved somehow. So this is what an action potential looks like if you graph out the changes in something we call membrane potential. I'll get to that real soon. Now what's happening is this membrane potential changes. It goes from negative to positive and fluctuates like this. Now this pattern repeats. So the thing is that this is measuring some sort of electrical activity. Again, potential, you don't have to come up with the physics definition for this class because it is actually electro, I think it's actually was physics 152. It's not even the Newtonian physics part. But for this class, just know it's kind of like the electrical charge inside of a cell. It's a very inexact and borderline inaccurate definition. But when you're starting out, I think this is the most accessible way to think of it. Now what happens is that what causes these changes in the electrical or electrical charge inside of a cell? Well, you have the movement of ions. And there's all these proteins that span the membrane of a neuron that move ions in and out of the neuron to change the actual ba overall balance of these ions and what we call the electrical potential of the membrane. So there are multiple steps and this is what these little numbers correspond to. There are different steps that causes different changes in the membrane potential of a neuron. So what we have are for, this is specific for neurons, what I'm showing over here. The heart has a different shape in this sort of change in patterns, and actually different parts of the heart have different shapes of this pattern. But for this class, and that the moment, since we're talking about the nervous system from this point on till the end of the semester, we will focus on neuronal action potentials. Now let's go back to top hat. All right, so let's go to the next top hat question. Oh. Well, actually, that was us. Oh, so actually, that was my sur physics survey. Never mind. Don't worry about top hat right now. Okay, my very, very basics with uh, physics right now. So here we have a positive charge and a negative charge. And if you remember all the way back to chemistry, where did we have positive and negative charges? Hmm, maybe we had them in ionic bonds. So what happens with positive and negative charges? is that opposites attract. You may have heard that term. So what we have here is that the positive attracts negative and vice versa. And so just like our sodium chloride that forms an ionic bond, the positive sodium cation is, is attracted to the negative chloride anion. Now what happens is this is like, if you repeat this over, remember positive attracts negative and vice versa and repeat this over and over again. This is why we get those ionic bonds and that crystalline structure we see in sodium chloride. Now, what we have are two, what about positive, positive, and positive, and negative? Well, opposites attract, like charges repel. So if you have a positive and positive charge put close together and just let them to their, to the, um, to their own devices, they will repel each other. And same with two negative charges. If you put two negative charges closest, so closer together, these electrostatic forces will force them apart. So opposites attract, light charges repel. So again, opposites attract, like repel. 
Now, how does this relate to membrane potential? So here we're showing just like, okay, you have multiple, you have a mixture of cations and anions on both sides of a cell. For this example, I'm showing you an artificial situation where we're just looking at positive cations. So here's the fluid surrounding a cell and here is the inside of a cell. Now, in this example, we have equal amount concentration of positive charges on both sides and pretend that this semi-permeable membrane allows both water and these ions to tra tra uh, pass through this membrane. Now, we can add a positive charge. It can diffuse toward this side. But what happens if you start to stack the positive charges on one side of the membrane? Then if you add more and more positive charges, what happens is that these positive charges will start to repel each other. So as you add more and more positive charges and create an imbalance where it's on one side, what is eventually going to happen is that it gets harder and harder to add more positive charges because all these charges are repelling each other. So if you have a high, char high positive charge on one side, it's going to be really hard to add more positive charges to that side. And if you want to talk about negative charges, similar thing happens with that. Now, eventually, if you, I'd like to use that example. Okay, um, so again, we have all these positive charges pushing back on further positive charges being added to this membrane. So I remember my example with the closet. The more you clothes you add to a closet or a drawer, the harder it is to add more of these clothes to that draw, drawer or closet. So say it's already full up and you have a lot of these positive charges on one side or any sort of ion on one side. It gets harder to add it, so if there's, it's not just about charges, but also concentration as well. So if you have a lot of something on one side of a membrane, the more of that you have, the harder it is to add more of that same substance to one side of the membrane. It's going to push back eventually. But the thing is, like, how do you add more? Well, you add more, if it gets harder, you may basically need more energy to add more and create that imbalance on one side of a membrane. Mm -hmm. So, then, so how do we move things from low to high? And basically the solution for that is to add energy via active transport. Okay, so a little review, and maybe we did come touch upon this very briefly when we talk about cell biology. Yeah, so pretend that a cell like a neuron is at rest. Is there more potassium on the inside or the outside? And this will be very useful because why? Well, let's see the answer first. So there is a higher potassium concentration inside the cell. That's what the majority said, and the majority is correct. So there is at rest, there's a higher potassium so concentration inside the cell. Now, how about sodium? Yes, people are remembering the banana in the ocean. So again, the banana is full of the potassium. So the, the banana is supposed to be an analogy to the cell. And where do we find more sodium chloride? Inside a banana or in the ocean? And yeah, that's the whole purpose. I'm glad that mnemonic analogy lives rent free because if it sticks in your head, I'm very, very happy and even happier if you can apply it. All right, let's see the responses. Most of you said more sodium on the outside of the cell, and yes, you're correct. More sodium as a cell at rest, there's a higher concentration of sodium ions on the outside of a cell. Now, let's go back to our real example. So what we have here is the cytoplasm and extracellular fluid. So again, the cytoplasm are the contents inside the cell. Now, remember our banana in the ocean. Why? Because at rest, there is a higher concentration of potassium inside a cell than on the outside. And what do, what's the ocean? The ocean is very salty. And what's the molecular formula for table salt? It's sodium chloride. So you have more sodium and chloride on the outside of a cell at rest. And the other thing is that this is the twist with the cell. So the cell has a lot of proteins and at the pH, physiological pH inside a cell at rest, the proteins tend to have more negative charges than positive charge. So overall, this is what we call the protein buffer system. That's a little advanced at this stage, but just know that proteins in general overall in the cell tend to have a negative charge and so this is why the cell has relatively negative balance of the ions compared to the outside. And the outside also has a lot of sodium. It's not equal parts sodium and chloride. So there's actually a higher concentration of sodium than chloride outside of the cell. 
So what we have is a very high positive ion concentration outside the cell. So very roughly, the outside of a cell tends to be more positive compared to the inside of the cell. The inside of a cell tends to be more negative than the outside of the cell. Now, why does that matter? Well, this is related to that membrane potential. So the membrane potential basically compares the overall balance of the electrical charges inside of a cell toward the outside, compare it to the outside of that cell. So membrane potential, well, basically is saying, this is a very physics and dry definition. The difference in the extra electrical potential between the inside and outside of a cell. So it's like, what's an electrical potential? If you're reading physics and this is like, oh, it's talking about like moving particles against the field, electrical field. You're reading way beyond the scope of this class. Don't worry about that definition for this class. But basically what happens is that membrane potential refers to some sort of unequal balance. And that's why I was talking about stacking a different, like not having equal balances of positive and negative charges. Because in a cell at rest, you don't have an equal balance between positive and negative charges on both sides of, of a membrane. So it's a, con a phenomenon we call polarization. When you separate the charges, so it's like a school dance where some of the kids are on one side of the, the, the building and then the, the other people on the dance are on the other side and they're not getting together. They are polarized at different, part, uh, different parts of the gym and they're not mixing together. That's what we call polarization, the separation of the charges. Now, this is my very, very inaccurate description of membrane potential. But I like to think of it as a cell's electrical charge. So I'm thinking, okay, the cell is negatively charged because it has relatively negative compared to its surrounding. So I find this is the easiest way, or at least this is when I, when I was first learning this. I got to admit, I had trouble with this concept at first. But once I thought, okay, this is rather than saying, like, oh, I'm always comparing it to the outside, I just thought, is the cell negative? Is the cell positive? And Again, this isn't something you should take to Physics 152 or any advanced class, but if you're starting out and you're having trouble with the concept of membrane potential, I find this is an easy way to get it accessible at first. So again, this is our definition. Do not use this in other classes. So this is why it's being graphed in that for graph of action potential. Now here we have an example. Now we're bringing both positive and negative charges in on this example right here. So what we have is an equal amount of negative and positive charges. Take my word for it, there are six of each on each side. Now what happens, what if we start to create an imbalance where there's not an equal distribution of positive and negative charges? So here we're going to move more positive charges toward the outside and more positive and bring in one of the negative charges toward the inside. Well, now the outside is going to be a little more positive and the inside of the cell is going to be a little more negative. So now we have a membrane potential because we have polarization. The membrane potential is going to be slightly negative because the cell has slightly more negative charges and negative ion balance compared to the outside of its environment. But what if we continue this trend and we use active transport to move more negative charges inside the cell and more positive charges and push them outside the cell? we start to increase their membrane potential in, or in terms of like the absolute value of it. So we're basically creating a bigger polarization or, or in terms of magnitude. So we're creating a, more of an imbalance between negative and positive charges. And then what happens if we do this? Well, now the membrane potential is completely reversed. So the outside is going to be very positive. The inside is going to be very negative. So you can have polarization, but we didn't. Ha we have a small degree of polarization here, but as we move more charges, we start to have more, more, po uh, even a greater degree of polarization. So basically, this is what we have here. So when membrane potential is equal to zero, that's what we saw in the previous example when we started out. So basically, when you have membrane potential is zero, and this is if you know your math, then have you know that. Delta refers to a difference in something, especially if you had calculus, you definitely need to know what delta is. So basically it's saying like the difference between the inside and the outside is zero. And when does that occur? That means the ions are in distribution of positive and negative charges in between the cell and its surroundings are equally distributed. So the charge overall charge is the same between the inside of the cell and the outside. 
Now, what happened? How do we get change the membrane potential, and how does that relate to that graph? Well, when you have a negative membrane potential, that means that the cell has more overall negative charge than its surroundings. And this again, this is my very inexact but accessible way of thinking about first. So does it have more negative ions on the inside than the outside? And this is a typical of most of your cells at rest. So the cells that your cells at rest, they have more negative charges and that's due to the proteins and all, also have bring relatively less positive charges than the outside. So you have more negative charges inside of the cell than on the outside. So the more negative, the bit the more this is imbalanced. So say we add more negative charges to the inside of the cell, this is going to make the memory potential even more negative. So it's about like you're going past zero, and the more negative anions you add to the inside of a cell, or conversely, the more you pump positive charges outside of a cell, it's going to bring the memory potential down. Now, what about the positive memory potential? We sell, say a cell has a positive membrane potential when a cell has more positive charge than its surrounding. Again, this is the fill 141, 142 definition. So say we have the inside of the cell, but now it's going to have more of these positive charges than its surroundings. Now the membrane potential will be greater than zero. We don't have an equal balance, but now the inside of the cell is relatively more positive. So we're going to say, so it's going to have, the membrane potential is going to be positive. So the more positive, the bit more of these positive charges that are stacked over here, or the more negative charges that are stacked on the other side, that's going to increase that number further. Now, there was a question about remembering voltage numbers for the exam. For this exam, go with what we go in lecture. If I want you to know these voltage numbers, I'll point them out in this lecture. So what we have here is this big number, a neuron resting membrane potential, we'll go with this number for this class, negative 70 millivolts. Some textbooks I've seen anywhere from six, negative 65 to negative 60, but for this class, let's just set it at negative 70 millivolts. So this is a neuron at rest. There's no action potentials. And what is that implying? So this millivolts is the membrane potential. So it's saying this resting cell right here has overall more negative charge than its surroundings. So the inside of the cell is negative compared to the surroundings, uh, surround the surrounding extracellular fluid. So negative on the inside and relatively positive on the outside. Now, again, our banana in the ocean. So we do have positive charges, but we have all that proteins and phosphate and other ions that cause the inside to be negative. So Again, remember, ions with that phospholipid bilayer and that hydrophobic tails that form the inside of it, that prevent that hydrophobic core or that hydrophobic layer in the middle of the bilayer, that prevents ions from actually diffusing across this plasma membrane. So how do you get these ions across? How do we do those action potentials? The action potentials need ion movement. So the way you drive ion movement is by having these ion channels. So what do ion channels do? They basically form passageways and doors for these ions to move from one side to another. So here we have a ligand gated ion channel and we actually know already know a ligand gated ion channel. So those receptors that bind to acetylcholine and open and allow sodium to flow into a skeletal muscular cell, that is a ligand gated ion channel. So a ligand is, or you might also see the term chemically gated ion channel. So the analogy I like to use is like, it's like a locked door. At rest, this ion channel is like a door that's locked, but the ligand or chemical that binds to this channel is like the key. So here we have acetylcholine binding to this channel that's at rest, but once acetylcholine binds to the receptor part of this channel, the channel opens and allows sodium to flow through. Now, which way is sodium going to flow through? It's going to flow, this is a passive transport process, so it doesn't actually need energy. It follows the rules of diffusion. This is more specifically, this is that facilitated diffusion. And how do things diffuse? They diffuse from high concentrations to low concentrations, right? So it's like having like open perfume bottle or like when someone brings a pizza into a room and it starts off very strong on that corner, but eventually reaches 
the smells and odors start to reach the other corner of the room and permeate. So same with ions. They start off at a high concentration, but if you allow them to diffuse, they'll move from high to low concentrations until they're about equal. There are also other forces at play here. There's also electrostatic forces, but for now we're just focused on concentration. Okay, so there's also a different type of ion channel. So ion channel implying that it will help the ions move from one side to the other. But now these are voltage-gated ion channels. So I like to think of them like those pin code locks or combination locks. They need to reach the right number for them to open. Now, instead of being open by binding to another chemical, what happens is that they're basically, the shape of these channels is affected by the charges inside and outside of a cell. So if you start changing the charges inside and outside of the cell, that changes the shape of these channels and causes them to open or close. So say we have this voltage-gated ion channel that only opens at positive charges. If the inside of the cell gets more positive due to something, say something like sodium flowing through, this will open these voltage-gated ion channels and allow whatever ion that they allow through to pass from high concentrations to low concentrations, ignoring the effects of electrical forces. Now, again, does the don't get confused that all of these are, these ion channels only open at positive charges. It's not necessarily positive or negative. I'm just showing you a simplified example here. They open within a certain range of voltages. So they'll open at a certain voltage, but they'll also close at a certain voltages. And I'm just talking about very general overview right now. There's also temperature gated ion channels, and these are interesting because they're only open at certain temperatures. So they're closed if they're not in that ideal range. Say you have like this temperature temperature gated ion channel that only opens in response to heat. Say you apply the heat, increase the temperature, this opens and allows sodium to uh, ions to flow through. There's also mechanically gated ion channels, and these are very interesting. So they're closed at rest, but what opens them? Well, mechanics implies some sort of movement or some sort of like physical movement, right? So the cool thing is that if you have anything that kind of disturbs or stretches or warps the plasma membrane, this causes forces that allow this channel to move open. So basically, if you move the plasma membrane, say you poke this, this cell's membrane, or you stretch the cell and stretch the membrane, this is going to pry that channel open. So, or if you play like a lot of games like especially like Tomb Raider or any of those adventure games, like you have like these doors that they are shut. And what do you have to do? You have to like get, or if you play those co-op games where you have to have people on different sides and they have to kind of pull the different areas of the door open so that someone can go through. That's what these channels are like. You have to like pry these channels open and then they shut if you don't have that force. But if you apply that force, that opens the channel and allows ions through. And why is again it's due to some sort of stretch or some sort of tension in the plasma membrane. Now back to our action potential. So this is why we had to spend so much time talking about membrane potential. It's all about this membrane potential changing and this pattern occurs. This is how these every time we have that little signal, this is how the signals that are carried along axons and from neurons to their target cells. So it always follows this pattern along a neuron. You start off with negative membrane potential, again, that magical negative 70 number. So again, some textbooks put to negative 65, but for this class, negative 70. And then when you do something called depolarization. So depolarization, well, remember polarization refers to those charges being unequally balanced. But when they're equally balanced on both sides, that's when we have that zero membrane potential, right? So when you're at this negative 70, that means you're polarized. You're very polarized. Your cells are very polarized toward the negative side of a, of compared to the outside. Now when you depolarization, depolarize a cell, that means it's going from this negative char membrane potential and going towards zero. So it does overshoot zero a bit. But again, this is at rest, but you're undoing that negative membrane potential. So that's why it's depolarization. And then it hits this peak right here. So it actually overshoots zero and ends up in the positive range. Now, this positive range, do I expect you to know that for this class? I've seen textbooks that go anywhere from 30 to 40 millivolts. 
So I think that one is a little more swingy in terms of like, okay, uh, there's a disagreement on like, what exactly is the peak membrane potential during a neuron action potential? Just know that it's definitely positive, definitely not zero. It's some positive number around the 30, 40 range. I'm not gonna ask you whether it's 30, 35, or 40. That's gonna be unfair. But know it's positive and know it's definitely not zero. Then after that, you see the memory potential drops again. So it's what we call repolarization. And why is it repolarization? Well, remember we start off polarized here. What happens is now you're going past zero and making the cell negative again. And what's ha and these descriptions right here is telling you which ch ch channels are opening and closing. So all of these are voltage gated channels that open at certain voltages allowing certain ions through and through the movement of these ions that have charges positive or or actually in this case only positive this is going to change the, the membrane potential of a cell okay so to summarize that part once a cell resting cells membrane potential reaches a certain voltage ion channels either open or close and ions move in and out. That's what I'm getting at there. So big changes occur. This is why we see that starting off the negative, then goes really positive, then goes back to the negative. So it's all due to the movement of these ions due to these channels opening and closing. So action and potential is basically the repeatable sequence and this consistent sequence of these channels opening and closing and going from negative to positive and then negative again. So just the ion, then this is the signals your ne neurons pass to each other. They move these uh, neurons, or not, they move these ions, and this movements of these ions and this electrical activity passes along the membrane of an axon to tell other cells what to do. Now, the thing is that these action potentials actually don't occur by themselves. They only occur when the excitable cell, such as a neuron, reaches a certain voltage, and this is what we call a threshold. So this is basically a membrane potential voltage needed to do that spike and then drop. So if the thing is that the cell actually needs a little push, it needs a little budge, it doesn't just fire off these action potentials by themselves. So, or actually like, well, we get to the cardiac next time, but don't worry about this. So the thing is that if a cell just stays at negative 70, it's not going to form a, do an action potential. Now, as you push it toward the positive side, so what mean, that means is that you're adding more positive charges to the inside of this cell that's at rest, then this, okay, this number is also kind of like, uh, it's depend difference between different textbooks. I've seen negative 60, I've seen negative 55. The consistent part is that this is always more than the resting membrane potential. So maybe it's like 10, 15 more than the resting membrane potential of a neuron. It's toward the positive side. That part is consistent, but it's not all the way at zero. So once it reaches this magical number, whether it be negative 55 or negative 60 millivolts, it's going to fire off that action potential. It's going to cause that big spike that toward the positive and then that drop toward the negative. So the thing is that if you keep it at 70, this part doesn't happen here. But once you cross that threshold, then you get that jump in the membrane potential. So I like to think of it like a hill. So you have to get actually get on the top of the hill to make that jump, right? So I think, okay, you're starting off the resting membrane potential, but if you're just staying there, can you do that jump? You need that oomph and you need to get toward that threshold. So I like to think of the threshold potential. So this is our negative 70 and this is our negative 55 or negative 60. You gotta push that potential up a bit and then you can do that action potential up here. So think about this resting membrane potential. For a cell to actually get that action potential, it needs to reach that threshold. So this is the action potential I'm showing over here. Now, what happens if you push it slightly toward the positive, but the cell does not reach that threshold? Well, what happens if you're doing this analogy right here and you go up the hill, but you stop there? you're gonna slide back down, right? So that same thing with excitable cells. If you try to push it toward a positive threshold and you push it, but not enough to reach that threshold, it's just gonna go back down and go back to resting memory potential. So to actually do an action potential, you need to reach the threshold and then you can do the action potential. 
Some people like this analogy, some people don't. But if it works for you, I'm happy. All right, so action potentials do not happen until you reach that threshold. That's why I make a big deal. They don't happen by themselves. You need to push a cell toward a threshold. So Martini says negative 55 to negative 60. Other texts say it's around negative 50 millivolts. Basically, I want you to define what a threshold is. So for this one, I'm not worried about exact values for a threshold or the peak during an action potential. Just know that it definitely is more positive than a resting membrane potential. So a neuron's membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. Will an action potential occur? Okay, let's see the responses. Most of you said no, and most of you are correct. Again, negative 70 is resting, so the cell's at rest. It's not the threshold yet. Whether it's negative 50 to negative 60, it's not at that point yet. Now, next question. A neuron's membrane potential is now negative 45 millivolts. Will an action potential occur? And for this one, ignore refractory periods. We're just talking about cell going from rest, and now it's negative 45. Okay, let's see the responses. So most of you said yes, and you're correct. The majority is correct. So again, like that, regardless whether it's negative 50 to negative 60, this is definitely more positive than that. So you're going from that negative 70, now you're at negative 45. But remember that threshold is around negative 50, negative 60. So you went from negative 70, you went to 45. You're past the threshold, now you can do an action potential. Next question. All right, so a neuron's membrane potential went from resting, and now it's negative 100 millivolts. Will an action potential occur? So most of you said no, and you're, most of you are correct. So again, now you're going from negative 70, but now you're going to negative 100. So if the threshold is here, you're actually going even sinking even lower. So pretend like maybe there's a like, little ditch between, before that threshold. So that's what's happening when you have a very negative membrane potential. It's what we call hyperpolarization, and it actually moves you further from your target because you're going further toward the negative instead of going toward the pos relatively slightly more positive threshold. And let's see. Oh, and last question in this series. A ne neuron's membrane potential went from negative 70, and now it's zero. Will an action potential occur? results. So most of you are correct. Yes, an action potential can occur because again zero is more positive than negative 50, 60 ish. So yes, an action potential will occur assuming this is not talking about refractory periods. And let's see, ooh, one more question. All right. So if a sodium ion channel opens in a resting neuron, what do you predict will happen? Okay, let's see the results, and looks like most of you said it will flow into the cell, and yes, you're correct. So again, these ion channels participate in facilitated diffusion. So it's going to move from high concentrations to low concentrations. At a cell at rest, is there a high concentration of sodium on the outside or the inside? So remember, if you really like that banana in the ocean analogy, sodium higher on the outside at rest, so because it's more concentration on the outside, open the sodium ion channel, and sodium flows into the cell. Okay, back to our lecture. Now let's put it all together. Everything we learned, all this stuff about molecules and ions, you're like, oh my god, chemistry again. This is why I bring it all up again. So basically, you have this resting neuron, and you push it toward the threshold. Not coincidentally, these voltage-gated sodium ion channels, they open at this magical number whether it be negative 55, negative 60. So at this threshold potential, regardless of number, these channels open. So these channels open, and when they open, this allows sodium to flow in. Now when sodium flows in due to facilitated diffusion, again, I'm not showing like all the sodium ions, but I'm just showing you the overall movement. So when this happens, what happens to the membrane potential of this neuron? it's going to go toward the positive side. So another analogy I like to use is like, pretend this is like your bank account. And I know it's like, if you're in the red, like, ooh, okay, this might hit close to home. I know like student loans being there, I know how it is. But 
pretend you're kind of owe something like you have a m loans or something and you're owe this like this amount of money what happens when you get that positive inflow into your bank account what happens to your bank account it goes from the red and goes toward the positive right so pretend this initial jump this de depolarization you start off in the red you start off in the negative but the direct deposit hits and then it goes toward the positive but unfortunately that loan point payment happens eventually and what happens is that this potassium channels the, now these are not the same channels they're voltage gated but they allow potassium through and these open at that po very positive membrane potential and why is it very positive well you have all this sodium that flowed into the cell from the outside so this is the very peak this is where we're at right now so when these open at this very high and positive membrane potential this opens up and all the potassium flows out so what happens to the membrane potential of your cell well you have these positive charges but they flowed out of the cell so what's going to happen to membrane potential these positive charges are going to leave the cell so now the cell becomes less positive and goes more toward the negative and I like to, to go back to my bank account analogy you got that paycheck but you gotta pay your phone bill, you gotta pay your car recertification and safety check, you gotta pay your Netflix account and Amazon Prime and Disney Plus and Peacock if you're feeling extra bougie. So you're paying all this stuff and you're like, oh crap, like I'm back in the red again. Like you finally pay your credit card bill and you're down there. So this is what's happening. You're losing this positive ions, you're losing all that money. So this is what's happening. You're going back down to the, ne to the negative potentials. And now where are we right now? So we're done with the action potential. But remember where we started? We had the banana in the ocean. We have more sodium on the potassium on the inside, more sodium on the outside. But because we brought more sodium in and we also let loose a lot of our potassium to the outside, we want to get back to where we started. We want to start with more potassium or more sodium on the outside and more potassium on the inside. But right now this is the result of all that action potential. We have it topsy-turvy. How do we reset where we move the potassium back in and move the sodium back out? What we do, we need is something that transports that. Now, the thing is that I didn't show that there were actually a lot more sodium on the outside. So this is where we have that sodium-potassium exchange pump. So again, after that action potential, we, have sodium, we want to bring the potassium back in and we want to pump the sodium back out. So the sodium potassium exchange pump basically takes three sodium and then uses ATP because I'm not showing it this in the picture to keep it bit from being too busy, but there's actually still a lot of sodium on the outside. So you're trying to add more sodium to where there's already a lot of sodium. So you need energy. It's just like that energy you used to push that last piece of clothing into your drawer or into your backpack. And then you push it toward the outside and then when so fit in this pump is facing toward the outside, it also brings two potassium in with each cycle. And why does three in matter? So, so what happens is like you pump out three sodium, you bring in two potassium. Does this really matter in the grand scale of things? Like, okay, we know we move sodium back towards the outside, brings potassium back on the inside. I bring up this three and two number because it's often, especially if you're like a pre-med or like if you're uh, a nursing student, a lot of times this is like somebody won a Nobel Prize for this and it's like scientific canon. And this is often a common test question they love to say, like how many potassium, how many sodium are moved in one cycle of a sodium potassium exchange pump. So yeah, so what happens is that when you do this, what it does is restores this part. So the funny thing is that when you have that repolarization and the potassium leaving, it actually overshoots that resting potential over here. So at this point, it's actually what we call hyperpolarization. It's actually past that resting potential. But when you have this sodium potassium exchange pump, what it does is restore this back toward normal. So it's restoring it and hey, what do we see at the end of this cartoon? Now sodium's back on the outside, now potassium's back on the inside. So the sodium potassium exchange pump is important in undoing all the movements of the ions. 
and I love this meme, so Drake over here, and this I think this is from a mid school meme. But yeah, this is what the sodium potassium exchange pump does. It takes the energy from ATP, moves three sodium toward the outside, brings three in, uh, two potassium on the inside. So three to the out or wait, let me I got this reversed. So three sodiums toward the outside of the cell, two potassiums toward the inside of the cell. Alright, and that's what action potential is. So again, this action potential is all due to the movement of ions. Now the interesting thing is that, hey, if we have this all these positive ions moving in, it's going to make surrounding receptors and ion channels also open. Because why? If you're bringing all these positive ions in, it's going to bring other channels closer to the threshold. So this is why action potentials are actually able to spread across an uh, axon. As you open up one cha channel, it opens, starts to bring in more positive ions. They have to put push more uh, channels toward the threshold. And this is the martini version, so I like to do this. This is my simplified version. So what happens is that as these voltage-gated ion channels open at the beginning of uh, action potential and bring in sodium, the sodium is going to push neighboring ion channels toward threshold. So here's what we have. So these doors are opening in sequence. Why? Because all of these channels are opening in responses to this influx of positive ions. Now what we also have are myelinated axons and basically if you remember my from my um, micro or my glial cell talk is that you have these cells in the central and peripheral nervous system that cover axons and myelin. So the cool thing is that these co cover it up but with these gaps between the myelin it's what we call nodes of Ranvier. So these nodes of Ranvier, they, they, they're these like, basically they have these channels. But the cool thing is that you don't need to have all these channels lined up right next to each other. So the cool thing is with these nodes of Ranvier is that, you, or actually rewind a bit. So that previous example is what we call continuous propagation when you don't have the myelin. But with these myelin coverings here, what happens is that this change in membrane potential can be carried all the way the change in memory potential can actually reach toward the jump across these myelin gaps and then also go between these nodes of Ranvier. So this is what we call saltatory propagation because why this channels are opening but it's no longer it has to be all these channels opening in sequence right next to each other. It can jump between these myelin gaps and this is what we call saltatory propagation. So if you know the term salto or somersault, that refers to some sort of jump. So this is why we call it saltatory propagation. So continuous, it's a lot like a wave, but you need all these channels. But with saltatory propagation, you're jumping, and this is actually faster. Why? Because these channels, they, you don't need to open all these channels over here in continuous propagation. Or a saltatory propagation, you have fewer channels that need to open, and you can jump these gaps between the myelin. And that's it for today. And let's see, top half sink off sink. Ooh, that my, my solution for that always re, uh, was it clear your cache. And when will the next homework assignment open on top hat? It should open pretty soon because we're still in the middle of the nervous tissue, the chapter, but it should open very soon. All right. Okay, so, so we're over time. Sorry for running over time again. But again, this this is a tough. This is a content actually every year. I think this is one of the toughest subjects. So if you didn't get it the first time, don't be feel bad about that. Then this is a good thing that this is at the very beginning because I think this is one of those things that is hard to get over at the beginning of. It's like one of those hurdles. Like er, that, like osmosis is one of them. Like it's just every year it's a per, per, uh, perennially um, tricky subject for everyone. All right, but again, this is why we I put my lectures on YouTube when I remember to. But again, yeah, so this is like, if you didn't get it, by all means review, hang in there, all right? Grades, I really, I know, I just gotta like, let's get a bunch of coffee and <laughs> push everybody's grades through med student and undergrad. But yeah, see you all on Friday, and I'm glad to be back in class. I know, pretty stressful week. Take care, see you on Friday. Oh, and thanks to our mods as well.